Oi! I'm Ed Harrison for Real Vision, and I'm sitting here about to have a conversation with Peter Bookvar of Bleakly Advisors and Dan Alpert, who is of Westwood Capital. And we're going to be talking about the global economy, especially in the wake of the pivot that the Fed has done. I mean, not just a pivot, but a whole 180 degree turn. And we were talking about this a little bit before. Uh, you know, the preconditions for uh, the Fed's pivot was that the United States was outperforming, uh, both on an economic basis and also throughout uh, on a uh, market basis. The equity market in the United States has outperformed the rest of the world. The real question is, A, why did the Fed make the pivot that it did? And B, given that the pivot actually happened, is that outperformance going to last? Let me uh, turn it over to you. Why don't you start with that and you guys talk amongst each other uh, to, tell, to tell us what, what's, what's going to happen here. Well, we determined that the strike price of the Powell put was down 20%. <laughs> uh, so that sort of scared him when he saw the market reaction because it came on top of worries about uh, the U.S. and China trade deal going awry. It was also that the Saturday before New Year's, when everyone's on vacation, not just here but everywhere, Trump tweets the negotiations with China going really well. Well, of course, there was no discussions there, but he also saw the stock market falling. He panicked, particularly uh, on the fall on Christmas Eve, and pulled back that worry, combined with Powell in early January pulling it back. Because, you know, we can debate whether he made a mistake, he didn't make a mistake. You know, the Fed funds rate's still only two and a quarter, two and a half. So it's not like we have this really tight money. Now, relative to the context of the debt that we have and the yield curve and relative to interest rates around the world, well, yeah, we can be considered tight. But... It's a sad state when two and a quarter, two and a half in a Fed funds rate is considered tight. Well, yeah, I think I think the the, the dynamics of what was going on in the uh, in, in the capital markets is very clear. Uh, I'm looking at it more from the debt capital market side than from the equity capital markets. Um, but as a practical matter, um, you know, we had gone through a period of time where the Fed was trying to move the policy rate up consistently. Uh, it thought that it would get some. Uh, some movement in the long end of the curve. It did not. The curve flattened out. Uh, obviously, a lot of people took that as a potential portend of a, a future recession. But nevertheless, regardless of whether they, th that, that's true or not, uh, what the, the action that they were trying to achieve was to damp down uh, some of the asset bubble that, that's, that's happened, including in the equity market, but certainly in real estate and other areas. Uh, and so, you know, they didn't achieve that. In fact, what they achieved is slowing the economy. <laughs> um, and, you know, at that point, uh, we, you know, the, the, Fed, the Fed took a look at it and also, I think, quite frankly, reflected back on what they were trying to protect against. I mean, you know, if you don't have uh, significant uh, price bubbles in uh, price uh, inflation and you don't have significant wage inflation and all you really have is, is asset inflation, um, what what they were doing, the exercise that they were trying to uh, to go through, really was not likely to be successful without a rise in the long end. So uh, they reversed they reversed course as as uh, as as the environment changed and it became more uh, risky for them to uh, continue with uh, with with tighter money. And also, the Fed was double tightening with the balance sheet and, right. and the Fed funds rate. So it wasn't your ordinary tightening cycle. And I don't think that they appreciated the impact of the shrinking of the balance sheet, which they should have, considering that enlarging the balance sheet was meant to raise asset prices. They tried to sort of sneak in the back door that shrinkage of the balance sheet by calling it watching paint dry. And then all of a sudden, you reached a, a pressure point when the tightening reached a, a point where they had to say, OK, let's stop one. We'll continue the other, but scale that back as well. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that that the 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 the, the problem is is that the long end really didn't respond, right? I mean, you would think that if they were shrinking the balance sheet, and you know, they had built up quite a bit of longer duration paper. Admittedly, that had shrunk down because time had passed. Um, but you would have thought that the the long end would have have been more responsive in that type of environment. It really wasn't, um, and the reason is is that we still have globally. Uh, a shortage of sovereign debt relative to the demand for it. I mean, I'm talking about high quality sovereign debt countries that print their own debt, borrow in their own currency. Um, and so you, you know, you have global interest rates that are very low. The only thing I would argue that was pushing up U.S. interest rates was policy rate action itself. 
Um, and you know, you look at the delta between uh, U.S. interest rates on a real basis relative to the you know real interest rates elsewhere. Where where our debt is cheap, um, and uh, and the only thing that was was uh, creating that situation was uh, a. a, a a belief that the that that the policy rate would continue to move up. Now, we're on we're on a we're in a cuspy situation. We don't really actually have a consensus as to where the policy rate is going forward. I mean, there's sort of a, a, an acknowledgement that it's not going up anymore. Uh, but there are those of us, including myself, uh, who believe that probably around September we're going to see a policy rate cut, and that's going to change the dynamic all across the board. Are you behind that view? Do you think that we're going to see a policy rate cut this year? I, I do, uh, but I also think the long end, it was sort of reverse. When the Fed initiated QE, they did that to suppress long-term interest rates, but long-term interest rates went up when they did it because people thought they're inflating. So historically, when but the Fed raised interest short rates, time, then, then well, rates went around. up after QE1, <laughs> rates went up after QE2. Right. When the Fed starts a rate hike cycle because their track record with achieving a soft landing is so poor, it pays to flatten the curve. So when they were double barreling, uh, in terms of their tightening, it pays to flatten the curve because people know where this typically ends up. 10 out of the last 13 rate hike cycles since World War II put us into recession. So it pays to flatten the curve when the Fed is raising interest rates. And it, it worked because, look, we're seeing, we saw the economic slowdown and we're seeing have more likely to have a two handle uh, this year in GDP uh, than a three like we did last year. And it can get worse if this trade deal gets out of control, which will eventually lead to that rate hike. I'm sorry, that rate cut. Well, you know, uh, just backing up for a second, uh, let me ask both of you, because you both mentioned uh, asset prices. Uh, asset prices in America, uh, especially in the equity side, they've gone way up. I mean, the U.S. has outperformed. What's the cost of that outperformance? Everyone's been easy, and, and arguably the Fed has been tighter than, than the rest. So where's the outperformance coming from? Where had it come from? That, that's the question. Well, if you compare the U.S. markets versus Europe, we have a bigger concentration of technology, and that's been the leader of this bull market. So if you don't have a big constituency of tech stocks in your indice, well, you're going to underperform. And that's why I think the U.S. market's been so extraordinary because of, obviously, all the FANG stocks, and you throw in semis and software and all this and that up until, obviously, recently. But that is what separates our market from others. But you look at, China, look at China's market, at least the eight shares with Tencent and Baidu and uh, Alibaba, uh, they've been able to, at least that particular index, not the Shanghai Composite, has able to keep up a little bit. But that's why we've left Europe in the dust, because they don't have those, uh, th those technology contributions that we have. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll beg to differ in one respect. We have uh, a rallying secondary market, right? People are moving into, are, are trading in, in the shares of companies that are not doing a lot in the form of capital investment. Um, and so they're not really growing the, eco the economy on the ground. What, what's happening, in my view, is that you don't have a good base of uh, earning capability in the fixed income market, and so therefore people are looking for returns elsewhere. And that's always the case. Alternative investment is, uh, is always driving uh, uh, equity rallies. And so, you know, you, you have people going in, trading amongst themselves in, in, in shares and bidding the price up as, uh, as a result. It doesn't really indicate what's going on on the ground. I mean, you have, a, you know, you even look at the, the, the increase in capital investment as a result of tech, you know, the Tax Act of, uh, at the end of 2017. That capital investment, first of all, was very short-lived. It's over now. Uh, and it was all pretty much in two sectors. It was in intellectual property and computer equipment. Basically, people took advantage of the rapid depreciation or the expensing of, of, of equipment to be able to upgrade, you know, whatever they were looking to upgrade. This was not plants and equipment. This is not job-creating stuff. Um, so you have, you have an environment in which the things that would normally give you good investment returns, both in the fixed income and in equity, are not are rather lackluster. They're just not happening. Uh, what is happening is there's a lot of excess cash lying around that's looking to make money, and of course, momentum is king at that point, and that's what really drives up markets. That and the fact that you can borrow cheap, uh, and when you look at, at uh, fixed assets, you know, real estate and things like that, it becomes a huge driver. If you look at, uh, at at what was going on when the Fed tried to start to push the curve up, right? Real estate went into a stall. 
uh, the housing sector went into an absolute stall, and that was frightening the hell out of the Fed. So, you know, going forward, you, you guys, uh, it sounds like you're on the same page and where things are headed. Tell me, where are they headed now that the Fed's made the pivot? We, we kind of know why the Fed made the pivot. Uh, they were scared. But what's going to happen as a result of that pivot to the U.S. economy? And how does the U.S. do relative to the rest of the world? Well, as of a few weekends ago, the Fed is now background noise. And it's only about, obviously, a trade deal with China or not. Mm -hmm. Because the U.S., well, the global economy, if you look at the global PMIs, which are basically hovering around flatline on the manufacturing side, uh, you see the, the trajectory of growth. You see this collapse in global sovereign bond yields with, uh, of course, the, the Spanish tenure the other day uh, closing at an all-time record low. And that's telling you that the global economy is slowing. You're seeing in all the statistics. And you know, the day of this airing, we, we, uh, of the taping, uh, South Korea reported for the first 20 days of, of May almost a 12% decline in, in exports, driven by a decline in the exports of China and also semiconductors. So we are at a like brass knuckles point with this trade deal. And it is either going to push us into a global recession, I believe, or we can at least pull back and, and, and catch a breath. So the Fed, they're just going to be reactive at this point. And their, their reaction function will be, OK, let's cut rates. That's what every central bank's reaction function is. I think we're at the point now, and this will separate this economic downturn from previous ones, is central banks are not going to be able to save us, that there's not going to be any, any um, incremental economic activity that's going to happen if they lower interest rates. Because the cost of money is not a binding constraint really on anything. You know, the Reserve Bank of Australia is basically telling the markets they'll likely cut rates in a couple weeks. Well, their rate is already at a record low of one and a half percent. Do they really think by cutting to one and a quarter, they're going to be able to tweak the inflation rate to such an extent and lead to a pickup in growth when what their economy is suffering is actually a housing bubble that is now uh, unwinding and consumer debt levels that are way too high? I mean, it's a sense of hubris, and, but they're going to try. And I think we'll, we're going to reach a point where we're going to be, there's going to be monetary impotence. We're not going to respond to that so-called medicine. And I'll take it one step further. I argue that monetary policy in, in Japan and in Europe is actually restrictive mm -hmm. because they're damaging the profitability of their banking system via negative interest rates and zero yield curve. So if you kill the banks, well, how are you going to get growth? So we have to be careful with our words of data versus tight. Because, uh, again, I, I argue that the Bank of Japan and the ECB are actually tight. Interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting view. Um, look, I think to a certain extent the, the trade negotiations and, and the, the tariff concerns are an overblown sideshow. Uh, what we are confronting here is the same thing we've been confronting for years now, which is a global environment in which there's an enormous exportation, exporting of disinflation from uh, the developing emerging world to, into the uh, advanced nations. Um, that disinflation uh, was something that you know seemed to have subsided for a period of time a couple of years ago. Where so suddenly we, we were coming to the other end of the Fed's famous transients, right? Uh, but the transients now seems to have resumed. And I put those in scare quotes because it wasn't transient, it was ongoing. <laughs> um, th this is a persistent phenomenon. It's going to continue uh, for, uh, you know, the, the, really for the foreseeable future. We have massive oversupply in terms of a huge excess population uh, that is producing goods, dedicating their labor, um, that is, uh, you know, associated with the, the post-socialist countries that, that emerged uh, beginning in the 1990s. Um, and those countries are going to continue to export deflation effectively uh, abroad. Uh, that is going to be uh, offset in places like the United States uh, by those things that, don't, uh, that are not in the tradable sector, right? And clearly the biggest one is housing. Um, and if you look at inflation during 2018 and during 2017, almost all of it, I'm, I'm, it, never before in history have we seen a sustained period where 80 to 85 percent of inflation, when you actually break it all down, uh, is from rent of primary residence and owner's equivalent rent of primary residence. Uh, those two categories, uh, and that's all the inflation we really had. You take that out of the uh, out of the story. Inflation in the United States 
is less than half a percent. Um, and, and so when you, when you look at the world that way and you say, well, gee, if there's this massive excess of uh, production capacity of labor relative to aggregate demand, how are we going to bridge that gap, right? And what, what are we going to do while we wait for that gap to be bridged? That's really the question going forward. We've tried everything else, and unfortunately, we're still right back in that same situation. So what's going to happen to inflation over this coming year, and what, what impact is it going to have in terms of the trajectory of the United States? Well, I'm sure we'll continue to see this goods deflation, but we'll have to see with the tariffs. Goldman Sachs had an interesting uh, chart out a few weeks ago where they sort of isolated the goods impact from tariffs. And so the, the, the sectors that are directly impacted by the tariffs, and those prices went up, and prices of everything not impacted went down. So if you throw in the 10% to 25% on the $200 billion, and then you add in another $300 billion plus, well, you're going to start to see goods inflation. Now, whether that can be offset by the Chinese absorbing it or companies absorbing it or not filtering through to the consumer, either way, there's, it's a tax and there's going to be inflation in the system where someone's going to eat it, whether it's via a profit margin or it's the consumer paying more at, you know, at a toy store, whatever it is. Uh, so I know there's a debate whether tariffs are deflationary or inflationary, but it is inflationary. It just depends on where in the product cycle uh, it gets eaten. Let me pivot uh, on, based on that because the one missing link in everything that we've been talking about since the beginning of this is Europe. You know, because when we talk about the rest of the world, whether the U.S. is outperforming or not, really, you know, from an investor perspective, you're thinking Europe because nothing that either of you have said sounds positive in terms of the impact that it's going to have on Europe. Where is Europe going to be given these forces that are bearing down on us? You know, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Europe is, is, is a very, very strange case right now, right? Because we tend to treat Europe as, uh, as Europe, right? Right, so we, we, as a monolith. As a monolith. Uh, and we then tend to treat the Eurozone as, as uh, one statistical reporting entity. Right. The problem is, is that it's really not right. It's it's a bunch of co countries agglomerated together, sharing a common currency, and giving up all of their sovereign right to devalue their their mode of exchange. So, uh, you you know, you look at what's going on in Italy right now. I mean, you you, I would say fifty fifty. You're going to have a lira at some point. If Italy uh, undergoes additional strain, they're going to have to leave uh, the zone. Um, but the, regardless of whether or not that happens, there's one country in Europe that is different from all the rest. You know, it's one of these things is not like the other, and that's right. Germany, right? So Germany has tied itself to a currency uh, that benefits it, right? The Eurozone itself has a depressed Euro. I mean, you know, you can see what happens every time the Euro scooches up near to 115, the economy slows. Right, because basically Germany is not able to take as great an advantage of it from an export standpoint. So you know, you, you've got you've got a, you've got Germany that's tied itself into this undervalued currency that gives it a huge unfair uh, trading advantage globally, and we have not. The United States has not come up with a reasonable response to that. We've sort of accepted Maastricht and the EMU as though it always would and always should be. Um, but, but in fact, it, it's created an environment in which uh, neither the periphery of Europe nor um, uh, the United States is benefiting. And so that, that's a situation that's going to be in, in complete flux. I mean, yes, I do agree Europe's slowing and Europe's going to have to, Draghi or his successor is going to have to do whatever it takes uh, again. Uh, to spark it up, but you know, the the, the long-term situation is that it's not it's not viable. Well, I've talked to people who talked about uh, European reacceleration. Uh, that is, is is that you know maybe the potential growth is lower than the U.S., but actually, they could outperform. Well, outperform, I guess, in relatively speaking. I mean, if, if Europe grows two percent, that that's a victory. <laughs> and you know, to add on to Germany, you know, France. I thought had a chance when Macron was, was elected. And from a business standpoint, wanting to sort of liberalize their economy, both in terms of the labor market, the regulatory system, the tax system, I think he's trying to, to get there. But there's, this is still a, a general welfare state, predominantly. And that's going to be, in addition to all the debt that they have, you know, a wet blanket on growth. And getting back to my point earlier about 
you know, the, the European banking system. I mean, Draghi went to negative interest rates in June 2014. European bank stock index is down 40%. What does that say? I mean, nominal lending growth is about three and a half percent nominal. So you can see that 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 has not that has completely backfired on them. So I think, in a way, we, we need to have some pain in order to get to better times. Whether it's and and I think a very important event the rest of the year is who's going to replace Draghi, because let's just say it's Jens Weidman. Mm. Well, how long are the German people if he is the guy? going to say, okay, negative interest rates is still a good idea. Because they say, well, we got our Bundesbank guy in there. Let's get out of this negative interest rate rat hole, which I call it. But just getting from negative 40 basis points in the deposit rate to zero, when there's $10.5 trillion of negative yielding bonds, you know, is going to be a sovereign bond earthquake. Because that's where the, the epic bubble... is going to happen, though. Well, that, it, it may not for a while. But negative interest rates is not sustainable forever. I mean, even, even the Swiss National Bank head, Jordan, the other day said, yeah, we, need, we know we need to get out of this at some point, just not now. And I have don't, no idea when we'll try. So, and all, a lot of the European banks own a lot of the sovereign bonds, so what you would need to do is go to zero and then have a recap of a lot of the banks that can't handle uh, a decline, mar uh, a mark to market decline in their bond portfolio. But there needs to be a big shaking up, or else we're just going to all be Japan, which we seem to be doing. So from an from a economic standpoint and from a monetary standpoint. I mean, Japan was a perfect example of how not to run monetary policy over 30, 30 years. And Draghi decided to do the same exact thing. And Bernanke into Yellen, by keeping rates at zero for seven years, decided to do the same thing. And thinking that you know, low rates forever is accommodative. But at some point, low rates forever is no longer stimulative because it doesn't alter behavior. Yeah, but it, does, it doesn't exist in a, in, in a vacuum. It, it, the, the, the truth is that all of these countries, including the Japanese, were doing it in order to sustain the asset complex, right? You, you, you really have a choice at some point. You can allow, I mean, you can be melon during the Depression, right? And you can say, let's let it all melt down and let's build it back. That's sort of a pure capitalist point of view. Um, we didn't do that during the Depression, I might add. Uh, and and uh, you know you, you can you can you can take that look at it, but at the end of the day, the, the trade off is a collapse in wealth, a massive collapse in domestic wealth, and that's all that cheap money is doing. And in fact, I would argue, I would agree with you, it's done it too too well. Um, you know, you you, uh, you you get to the point where you're you're juicing asset values back up to a point where they're no longer reflecting the utility. It sounds like from both of you that. There are two sectors that are creating a differential between the U.S. and Europe, in particular, banking. You mentioned, you know, and the debt overhang. You also mentioned uh, technology, and does that account for the PE differential? Because the U.S., in terms of the relative value, we are at a 20, 30-year high relative to the rest of the world. Can that continue on through this cycle where? Uh, the, the, the Fed is going to be cutting rates because potentially a recession. Well, U.S. markets are always more highly valued compared to everybody else. Just we have higher returns on equity, better economic system, faster growth, higher profit margins. So that's just natural. And I guess you're pointing out is the extent at which we are valued relative to the rest of the world. And, you know, again, technology stocks have a lot to do with that. Now, over the, will the next 10 years be different than the prior 10 years, I guess, is what you're asking. And is, are we going to be able to outperform to the extent that we have uh, over the past 10 years? Or and, even let's, and let's talk about the next two years. Next yeah. two years. Well, it, it's who, who knows the next two years. But, yeah, you have the potential. But these other areas of the world have to get their act together. I mean, European com you know, companies and countries have to get their act together from, on the fiscal side. And, and, and I do think Japan, for example, at least on the corporate, corporate Japan, has – is paying more attention to returns on equity and shareholder value and corporate governance and stock buybacks and this and that. So there is a fighting chance for these other countries uh, to outperform the U.S. because the, the U.S. market cap is at its biggest piece of the pie of the total global market cap pie than we've ever been. And I don't see that being sustainable when over the next 10 years a lot of economic growth will happen overseas and our portion of growth will continue to shrink just by the, the law of numbers. You know, it should, also be kept, it should also be kept in mind that Europe and Japan have something in common and something very different than the United States. 
they are still very much in a bank-dominated capital market. Uh, you know, we, for, for all intents and purposes, the U.S. banking system has become what, you know, Paul Volcker once called it, which was a, a mortgage originator tied to an ATM, right? There's, there's really not, they don't do any CNI lending to speak of. I mean, they say they do, but there's not, there's very, very little there. Um, most, of, most of what they're doing is short term. Uh, there's no, there's no long-term borrowing from banks. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, as far as the mortgage origination machine is concerned, it's just basically an originate and sell model. So they're not holding very much on portfolio. So when you, when you look at, at the banking system in both uh, Europe and Japan, um, you, you know, you have economies that are totally dependent on these banks. And these banks are, you know, I would argue without being too brash, fundamentally insolvent. Right. In in Europe and, and in yeah, Japan. I mean, yeah. They, I mean, J Japan, obviously, they went through a period of functional insolvency during the 20 years of the recession. Then Koizumi came in in 2003 and started to clean them up a little bit. Uh, you know, he and Takanaka, they, 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 did, they, they made head roads and, you know, they, it was okay for a while. But as a practical matter, any crisis will move them in the, in, in the downward direction. Europe's are beyond hope in an aggregate sense. I mean, obviously there are some that are better than others, but uh, uh, you know, if you aggregate the entire European banking system and marked it to market, it would be one giant pit in the ground. Um, and, uh, and that's not a healthy environment to be in. You know, the, the, the lack of uh, a true capital market uh, you know, outside of the banking system is, is a big problem for Europe. It sounds to me like both of you are talking about US outperformance lasting, even in a world in which uh, the, the Fed is cutting rates because of the potential for calamity in the United States. Well, it's the winner among losers, right? I was also throwing, you know, we didn't talk about you know, emerging markets sort of being in, in, in that middle ground where mm -hmm. obviously if we go into a global recession, emerging markets will not be immune. But if you look out over the next five to 10 years, you know, the growth, in my opinion, is in emerging Asia particularly. Uh, I know China's got their problems, of course, and as wherever China goes, so goes that area. But if you look in terms of demographics and debt levels and, and, and business growth, it is going to be in Asia, and it's going to be emerging Asia. So uh, I'd argue over the next 10 years, emerging Asian markets are going to do uh, better than U.S. markets. Dan, you agree with that? You totally. Think? Yeah. A absolutely, without a doubt. Let me give you the last word on that, uh, Peter. So what is the thing that we need to do going forward to uh, jumpstart the U.S. economy, continue the growth that we've seen not just in asset prices, but actually jumpstart real growth in the economy and in wages? Uh, well, asset prices and GDP are not necessarily always correlated. Right. So uh, basically saying in the 10th year of this economic expansion, which is the longest on record as of this summer, how do you continue it? And uh, historically, it ends about now, of course. And uh, I, I think it's do no harm is how you continue in economic expansion, because most of them have been killed by central banks. And you combine, and we still have interest rate hikes that are working its way through, through the system. We also have the Fed still shrinking their, their balance sheets, so they're still tightening. Uh, so right now, I think we're doing harm. We're doing harm, well, I'm, I'm not saying all harm is necessarily bad. I mean, the, the low interest rates forever was not sustainable. So we needed to pull back a lot of that monetary stimulus. stimulus. But the, the do no harm to me is, is well, you're doing harm with respect to the tariffs. And, and, and from an intangible standpoint, uh, the mistrust between the two biggest economies and how they're just going to try to clip us and, and, and saying, you know what, I'm going to buy that Xiaomi phone and that Huawei phone instead of an Apple phone. And like they, like they did to uh, in, in cars in Japan and how they tried to clip South Korea. And, and that this is not good for global growth to have the two biggest economies going at it like this. And hopefully it ends up OK. Hopefully we pull this back but I don't think we're on a sustainable path for robust economic growth. And then you throw in, obviously, the issue with Europe, where, where the European area is, has a bigger economy than the US. Uh, so again, bottom line, do no harm is how you sustain an economic expansion. And we're throwing too many rocks and throwing too much mud into the cycles of this, of this economic expansion that, to me, it's, it's threatened every day that it continues. So that was a pretty uh, intense debate there, not just about uh, whether the U.S. is going to outperform, but also about a lot of the uh, political economy issues. I want to thank uh, Peter Bukvar, 
from Bleakley Advisors, and I want to thank Daniel Alpert from Westwood Capital for coming, and uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Thanks very much.